Um, thank you, Keith, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am so happy to have you joining us today for the Graduate College's uh, third annual Distinguished Lecture event. Um, of course, last year it was completely remote. This year it is in person as well as, in, uh, as, as, well as remote. We had um, over 700 people um, RSVP to attend the virtual part of this session. So while we look around the room and see a nice number of people here in person, we also want to uh, thank the people who are joining us here um, remotely as well. I think it's a great new way of being able to communicate and get messages out to people. Um, before I begin, I want to thank the staff who made this event possible. Um, Tracy Veselia, uh, Lily Torovora, and Keith Chandler, who you already saw speak, from our marketing and events team who made us possible to gather in person, um, as well as Jim Salisbury and the team from the ASU Marketing Hub who made it possible for us to broadcast this event um, to the people that I mentioned before. Um, joining us later on stage to facilitate a discussion with our, with our speaker today is uh, Dr. Batinto Batts, who is an award-winning journalist, a professor and dean of the Walter Conkright School of Journalism and Mass Communication, who joined us um, at ASU just this past year. So we're really grateful that he was able to come and facilitate today. For those of you who don't know, the Cronkite School is widely recognized, I think everybody probably knows that, widely recognized as one of the nation's premier professional journalism programs and really strives uh, to foster journalistic excellence. And we had a really great discussion earlier today about how journalism is really shaping and changing the way that we're thinking about journalism, the Cronkite School is. Um, under Dean Batt's leadership, the Cronkite School will continue their mission to work collaboratively where journalism, communications, and other disciplines truly intersect to create opportunities for organizations to thrive and to produce research and content that impacts communities and the people within. Dean Batts joins us today as a journalism professional to ask important questions um, about today's topic and to relay the questions submitted by our event registrants. So I think all of you probably got cards that you can submit questions for and we hope you participate in that way as well as the people online. Thank you for joining us today, Dean Batts, and we look forward to the discussion in a few moments. I want to take a quick moment here to remind everyone of ASU's charter. We're a comprehensive public research university measured not by whom we exclude, but rather whom we include and how they succeed. Advancing research and discovery of the public value and assuming the fundamental responsibility for the economic, social, cultural, and over health, overall health of the communities it serves. The Graduate College, of course, believes strongly in this charter, and we are dedicated to enriching and advancing graduate school experience for all students and bringing a student-centered culture with a commitment to inclusion and innovation. Today's topic of canceling student debt and its equitable implications are not without debate or opposition, but that should not prevent us from having this conversation. Author and educator Stephen Covey once said, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. Today, it's my hope that we gather here to listen with the intent to understand. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, noted educator, journalist, and scholar, Dr. Andre Perry. Dr. Perry is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and nationally known and respected in the fields of race and structural inequality, education, and economic inclusion. He is the author of the book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities, in the field of education, Dr. Perry worked in the Louisiana government, founded the College of Urban Education at Davenport University, and was an associate professor of educational leadership at the University of New Orleans. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andre Perry. Hello, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon. I'm Andre Perry. Uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And if you don't mind, I'm going to jump right in to my presentation today. And I really wanted to start off talking about who I am and, and why I, I pursue the, these issues. 
Um, as was stated, I work at the Brookings Institution where I study black majority cities and neighborhoods. And as you can see, there are lots of black majority cities. There's obviously too many neighborhoods to put on a map. But there are 1,200 or more uh, black majority cities where the share of the black population is 50% or higher. I try to assess the assets, the value of those assets, um, things that are worthy of our investment. And if we invest in those things, we should see economic and social mobility. I, I want to just show a, a quick slide here. The reason why I study um, these issues and the assets is because there's a significant wealth divide in this country. Um, white family median wealth is about 170,000 compared to 17,000 for black median um, wealth. Um, not only did federal, state, and local legisl legislatures intentionally throttle black wealth with malicious policies that exacerbated the legacies of ra race of slavery, such as Jim Crow laws, biased housing, and criminal justice practices. They excluded black Americans from reaping the full benefits of the New Deal, which lifted many more white families out of poverty and enabled them to pass on intergenerational wealth. In my studies, I look at a lot of different um, things that impacted today's society. Um, one of the, some of the things that I'm very involved in is the issue of redlining, where the federally backed homeowners loan corporation drew red lines around predominantly black neighborhoods, deeming them unfit for or, or hazardous for investment. I also look at the impact of highway construction um, on, and, and the displacement of black families. Uh, my family was decimated by this, um, these, these issues. Urban renewal, as well, uh, the unfulfilled promises of urban renewal, predatory lending. Um, my family lived in areas where there were lots of uh, rent-to-own schemes and, and, and other um, predatory uh, situations. And then there were restrictive housing covenants all around them. So they couldn't move. The, these policies that basically said you had to be white in order to live in this neighborhood. That had an impact. Uh, right on this, this chart, I hope you can see it, on that x-axis, that's the, the percent of black people, uh, black people within a neighborhood. And on the y-axis, as indicated by the price of the bar, uh, by, by the price indicated on top of the bars, that's the average list price of homes in those neighborhoods. Now, um, for those who cannot see, um, the, the average list price of homes in white neighborhoods, and we looked at both Zillow as well as census data, the average list price is about $340,000 um, in, in neighborhoods where there are little to no, no black people in it. But in areas where the, the black population is 50% or higher, they're about half as much, about $180,000. Now, a lot of people will say that's because of education, that's because of crime, that's because of, of other of, of decisions. But those are things you can control for in a study, and that's what we did. We looked at the absolute price difference, we looked at structural characteristics, we looked at neighborhood amenities. So we wanted an apples to apples comparison between homes in black neighborhoods and homes in white neighborhoods. Again, we controlled for these issues so we can get to that apples to apples comparison. And what we found is that homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by 23%, about 48,000 per home. Cumulatively, that's about, a, a, about 156 billion in lost equity. Now, this is not over time. This is one year. This is 2017 data. 156 billion in lost equity. And this is occurring all across the United States. Wherever you see a magenta circle on this map, that's where homes in black neighborhoods are priced actually lower than their equivalent counterparts in white neighborhoods. There, wherever you see a green circle, that's where homes in black neighborhoods are actually priced higher than their white counterparts. Just, just to give you some examples, um, Lynchburg, Virginia. If you helicopter at a home and from a black neighborhood and, and placed it in a similar a neighborhood that had similar education, crime, all those social amenities, it would increase in value by 81%, moving from a black neighborhood to a white neighborhood. 81%. Again, we try to get the, what, what does it mean? What is the value based upon this 
physical building, this, this facility, this property, if it, what it, should it be worth? In Lynchburg, it should be worth 61, I mean, 81 percent more in, in black neighborhood. Rochester, New York, negative 65 percent. Jacksonville, Florida, uh, um, 47 percent difference. Again, there are places where homes in black neighborhoods are actually priced higher. Nashville, plus 10 percent. Wichita, plus 16 percent. Boston, plus 23 percent. I always got to remind people, though, that Boston's no less racist than Lynchburg, but the home prices are higher. But I just want to get this in perspective before I get into this uh, point of canceling student debt. What is 156 million? Well, it would have paid for or financed more than 4 million black owned businesses based upon the average amount of that blacks use to start of their firms. It's double the annual economic burden of the opioid crisis. It would have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan 3,000 times over, covered nearly all of Hurricane Katrina damage, and it would have paid for more than 8 million four year degrees. 8 million four year degrees. This is why I say that there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. When things go wrong in black communities, we blame black people all, the, all, all day long. There's a reason why black people have to take out more student loans. Because we were denied the wealth that would have enabled us to pay for a college. So I wanted to start there that there is this big wealth divide that black people live with, most black people live with, and I don't care if you have a PhD, I don't care if you're, 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 you, you have a high income, most black people did not receive the intergenerational wealth transfer as our white counterparts. That's a direct result of federal, state, and local policy. Not because of financial literacy, not because of, of, of a lack of hard work, not because of choices. Because black wealth is, uh, is systemically extracted in housing policy, in health policy, in education, all in, in many different sectors, you see this kind of wealth extraction. Now, student debt is a larger source of household indebtedness than credit cards or automobiles and is surpassed only by home mortgages. From 1993 to 2012, the share of students taking out student loans rose roughly, roughly half to over two-thirds. Between, between 1993 and, 19, and 2020, the average loan amount grew nearly threefold, exceeding $30,000. This wouldn't be a, much of a problem if borrowers' incomes kept, kept pace with the rise of inflation. While most analysts and politicians across the political spectrum believe we have a student debt problem, there is no similar consensus in their various proposals on how to deal with it. Much of the debates revolves around how much student loan debt should be discharged. In a few minutes, I will share with you why we must consider black people's wealth when considering how much student debt we should cancel. We must center black people in our deliberations for it is the who in policy that determines many budgetary considerations. Remember, when it was white suffering during the Depression, what did we create? Housing policy to alleviate the suffering. But when it became black people's suffering, as early as this pandemic, we created PPP loan uh, programs that s essentially precluded black people from it. So it's the who that we must be concerned with in these debates. Understanding the impact of student debt on black people can shed light on how much we should cancel for everyone. I, I wanted to show you this brief clip um, be, before I get into student debt. This is me testifying on Capitol Hill. This is Representative Al Green from Texas. And he asked us a basic question. Do we believe that there's discrimination in housing markets? Do we believe, or in, in, the, in the evaluation of homes? Take a look and listen to this. Now, I presented a lot of the data, the same data I presented to you, I presented in Congress, 
um, members of the appraisal industry are sitting there with me. Roll that clip. If you think black people are being discriminated when their property is being appraised, would you kindly raise your hand? One person on the panel. That's me. If you think that, for fear that I'm not communicating well, if you think that black people are not being discriminated against when their property is being appraised, if you think they're not being discriminated against, kindly raise your hand. Okay, hands now, we're getting some consternation, I see. Before we begin, we have got to accept data and facts. Two years ago, the, the appraisal industry um, said on that stage there, there, there was no discrimination, right? Three years, two years later, they've done a 180. This report has influenced this, this issue mightily. Um, you see ev almost every month a story coming out about a black family refinancing their home, finding out they're getting a low appraisal, then they get a white stand-in, and then the, the, the second appraisal, co appraisal comes in, oftentimes hundreds of thousands of dollars higher. That, that video did not age well for many people in that industry. Please don't be in videos like this, <laughs> right? Do not make that mistake. It's okay to debate. It's okay to debate and to argue and, and to fight in some cases. But there are objective truths. You go to grad school to help us determine the, those objective truths. So for today, I just want us to accept some fact as truth. We can debate, you know, uh, uh, around the merits of it, but let's, this for a moment, let's accept some of the numbers I'm about, about to throw at you. First, let's center the experiences of people like Jordan Long. To avoid $60,000 in debt, Jordan dropped out of Morehouse College one year before philanthropist Robert F. Smith paid for the debt of 2019 graduates, essentially canceling $30 million in loans. I mean, a few years ago, I don't know if you remember when this news came out, everyone was shouting for, for, for joy, but Jordan, unfortunately, could not take advantage of the, um, that gift. When you learn about Jordan's family background, you know that his mother also dropped out of college because of financial reasons. We will come back to what's happening to Long and the Morehouse graduates towards the end of the presentation, but the point is we struggled as a nation to appropriately center the who in public policy and research, people like Jordan. This is particularly true in the student debt debate. One of the most repeated mistakes in the student debt cancellation debate is that the assumption that all people within a particular income strata have the same ability to pay back their loans, masking the lived experiences of black people. Colorblind income analyses miss the mark. Past discrimination should compel us to first check how, policy, how a policy might impact historically disenfranchised groups before we propose it. I will present evidence to show we have an economic and moral obligation to go beyond $50,000 in debt cancellation. I will show how the more debt we cancel, the more we close the wealth divide. The economic argument here is clear. However, ignoring wealth and the racial wealth divide, which many people, many opponents to this will do, is to bury one's head in the sand to racial injustice is to be the, on, on that panel to say, no, this is not real. Most student debt is held by households with zero to negative net worth. And black people are much more overrepresented among uh, 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 American population. An, an estimated 19% of American families have zero to negative net worth compared to 8% of white families. Over the last quarter century, black people went to college at higher rates, but we also took on more debt than our peers, damaging our capacity to purchase homes and start businesses. We've been told over and over and over again that a college education is the great equalizer. 
But the more we go to school, our, our wealth profiles aren't changing. That's an indication whether or not we're achieving the American dream. There we go. The reality is that white college educated households are much more likely to provide and receive financial support for education and or home purchases, while black college graduates are significantly more likely to financially support their parents, according to the Fed Reserve Bank of St. Louis. When, when we um, graduate from college, guess what we do with our loans? We support families with the, the, um, those loans, whereas other people are getting down payments for a home, for a car, um, to start a business. In a Brookings Jane Family Institute research brief, Jane Family Institute senior fellow Marshall Steinbaum, Brookings research assistant Carl Romer and I demonstrate that black people take out higher amounts of student loans than every other racial group. In addition, black students' current loan balances are much more likely to exceed the original amount, revealing the impact of discrimination on wealth. This chart right here eliminates the results of black people's efforts to attain economic equality or the American dream. The more we go to school, the more loans we take out. Guess what? Because we didn't have that intergenerational wealth transfer. But it also shows, um, it also um, shows it takes longer for us to pay back our student debt. You can see here, uh, um, Hopefully you can see that. Uh, the blue lines re represents black borrowers. At every age group, it takes us longer to pay, um, pay back our student loans. Not only are individuals saddled with debt, so are entire neighborhoods. Our report titled Student Loans, the Racial Wealth Divide, and Why We Need Full Student Debt Cancellation shows student debt as a share of income is highest and growing fastest in the lowest income areas. So this is hard to see, but you're, what, what you're really seeing here is that much of the student debt is concentrated in black neighborhoods, in, in neighborhoods where, that predominantly um, um, black people live in. The claim that student debt cancellation is regressive tends to be followed by pointing out that a large number of borrowers have a small amount of debt and a relatively minor number of borrowers, car bar borrowers carry a large proportion of the total debt burden. That much is true, but the unstated implication is that the low number of high balance borrowers uniformly have higher incomes. That implication is false. Uh, ah. Maybe I should point that way. Again, again, it's similar to the last slide. Um, the pl plurality of outstanding debt is held by borrow borrowers with higher balances who live in census tracts in which the median income is between twenty and forty thousand dollars. Meanwhile, high income census tract account for a very low number of borrowers, affirming that wealthy people are less likely to have student debt because they don't need student loans. And if they do take out loans, are much more likely to pay them back. When you look at where debt resides, again, it is held in low income neighborhoods. Other studies have reported that differences in interest in accrual and graduate school borrowing led to black graduates holding about twice as much student debt, 53,000 as our white counterparts, four years after graduation. Given the racial wealth disparities and debt to income ratios, it's not surprising an estimated 7.6% of black graduates default on loans within four years of graduation compared to 2.4% of white graduates. Without question, we have a student debt problem. Real solutions can be found when we look at the impact on wealth. When all student debt is canceled, the numerical difference between the wealth of non-black and black households shrinks significantly for households between the second and 20th percentiles. Carl Romer and I described in this in the report, student debt cancellation should consider wealth, not income. 
This chart can be difficult to interpret, but the black people represent, are, are represented by the per perforated lines, and they get closer to the solid lines that represent white people for every debt cancellation plan. Um, there, you know, Biden offered 10,000, Elizabeth Warren 50,000, and so we looked at each um, plan, and what it showed that the more debt you cancel, the more you close the racial wealth divide. And isn't that what we want to do? So in, what's important about this, and I'll get back to, to Robert Smith in a second. What is clear, I applaud Robert Smith's generosity. I think it's a good thing that someone um, canceled this debt for students. However, that's not policy. Jordan missed out on that opportunity because his mother also st struggled. This, this is a systemic problem that requires a systemic address. So for me, I'm going to um, close out here. One of the things, and I named my book Know Your Price, um, based upon my favorite book in the world, Two Trains Running. Now, in this book, um, or in this play, Two Trains Running, the main character, Memphis, is about to have his property seized through eminent domain um, by the city of Pittsburgh, where I'm from. And they offer uh, Memphis $15,000 for his property, to which the main character, Memphis, goes, no, I'm not uh, um, selling my property. I know my price. I got my price. And it's a re but he says that throughout the play. Um, it's a refrain. Now, there's another character, Hambone, in, this, in the play. And he makes a deal to paint a fence in exchange for a ham. Um, he paints the fence. He never gets his ham. And so throughout the play, play, he says, give me my ham, give me my ham, give me my ham, until he actually goes crazy and dies. Now, I know that you know, people are like, damn, that's pretty, pretty bad. But there's actually a happy ending. Um, the main character, Memphis, eventually gets $35,000 um, for his property. Now, the moral of the story should be clear, right, that you've got to know you have worth. What I try to do is give people the price to stand on, even if it means going crazy and dying. The, the facts are clear. If we cancel student debt, we close the racial wealth, um, uh, we uh, not close it completely, we help close it. We also need to, to, to work on medical debt. We also need to, to look on wages. We also need some form of reparations at some level. Right? And let's not, that's not a controversial topic because just a few, um, just a few months ago, we, we saw what happened when we shut down businesses. The business community said, hey, you injured me. We do need some type of reparations for that, some type of, uh, um, some type of stimulus program. And we delivered. Black people have been denied these opportunities for generations. What stimulus package, what kind of stimulus package do we need for that? One year in housing, 156 billion loss. One year. So for me, this is not about arguing and debating. I think the data is pretty clear on this. But I do need for you all to, to understand that at some point, this institution, in order for it to thrive, we need graduate students, undergraduate students to come here to learn without the, the fear of going into debt. Only there's m m it's something like 90 something percent of research R&D money goes to six states, six. We are not a country of six states. We built an economy on innovation and change. It's time to invest in the people that will give back to all of us. So I'm going to close there because I want to get into this conversation. But I want to, first of all, thank um, Dean Libby and, um, and, 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 and uh, man, I, I, Kath, uh, man, I'm blanking on your name. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe I'm just blanking on your name. Tracy, man, and Keith, I apologize for that. Um, 
because this is truly, I'm outside now, I'm, I'm, I'm on, on the road now, hitting universities and stuff. So I just want to thank you for coming out as well. Thank you very much. So thank you uh, very much, Dr. Perry, uh, uh, for your presentation. Uh, if anyone has any question that they would like to submit, please feel free to use the note card provided at check-in. Write your questions and pass those cards to the end of the aisle to be collected by our event staff. We will get to those as soon as possible. The deadline to submit your questions will be at 457 PM, which is right at the conclusion of our uh, question and answer today. So as previously noted, I, my name is Batento Batts. I am the Dean of the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Communication here at uh, ASU. And it's my pleasure this afternoon to uh, have the opportunity to interview you, uh, Dr. Perry, about your topic. And we've had some, um, some questions that were previously submitted to us uh, in, a, uh, in advance of the event today, and so I think we'll just go ahead and, and dig in here. Let's get it. Okay. All right, so as we know, is, is there any new legislation that is being considered that would support canceling student debt that we can support and that maybe that people might be aware of? You know, one of the things we don't fully recognize is that student debt is being canceled every single day. When you're talking about um, uh, the, the debt that was canceled from predatory institutions, the debt that is canceled for a small number of, of public service um, folks who went through that, that program, that, that failing program. Um, we've canceled debt for a number of armed service folks. Well, it's, the, the data the data is wanting on that, but we have canceled debt. We 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 do this all the time. It's just now we're talking about canceling m much more debt um, than in the past. Now and there's essentially three proposals that are that's out there. Um, Biden's been promoting ten thousand dollars worth of debt cancellation. Debt cancellation. Schumer, Elizabeth Warren are promoting fifty thousand. And there are few others that are in between. Um, but um, I think what is clear, the president or the Department of Education can cancel debt. There was some debate about that, but I think that's been settled. They can, without an act of Congress, cancel the, the, the student debt. Um, in addition, I do think that there will be bills passed to do it. Uh, I just think, think it's highly unlikely that during, when this freeze is over, this, this student loan, um, this uh, repayment freeze is over in January 2022, I highly doubt that they will ask students to pay during an election year. And so I also doubt that, that they will only do 10,000 at this point. So I think one of the proposals that will go to 50,000 are, are, are very viable. I think it's very viable. That's interesting. Uh, so what then, I guess, the reasons why you think that the, uh, the administration is not likely to turn back on the payments is because of the being in a, a midterm election year, and so that could be a midterm uh, election issue. Uh, yeah, but I mean, the main reason, and I don't know what this is about, but um, Biden, has, 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 uh, one, he, he, he didn't believe he could cancel the debt, although while, but he was canceling debt uh, of, over the last year and a half. I mean, he has that power. Um, um, but he also just believes in this idea that debt cancellation is regressive. You know, and I, I, I heard during a podcast once someone say, say something to the effect that we'll be canceling debt of physicians during this period of time. And I was like, 
during a pandemic, you're worried about canceling deaths or a physician. They actually served. That's not the example you give. They actually are, doing, are serving society well. That's an example of why we should um, cancel debt. But there's this old school belief that because I went to college when college was literally $200 uh, or something, or you know, $1,000, $5,000, when I went to, to, to school in 89, um, I went to a private liberal arts institution. It was um, 19000 a year. Now that same institution, I'm not, I'm not that old, I mean, uh, but um, that same institution, it's, you, wait a second, you're looking at me like, like, yeah, he is, yeah, you are. But that same institution now is $65,000. 65. Now, you know, I know there's new math at the ele elementary level, but they're still teaching math the same way they did in 1800 something. But the price keeps going up. And so for me, we've got to shift to say, hey, that the, the price of education has soared dramatically and we need an alternative. So um, what is clear, debt cancellation is only partially a partial solution. At some point, we need free college. At, at some point, we, um, and the Biden administration made clear, they want to make community college free. I really believe we should make public institutions overall free. The, uh, clap that up. You can clap that up. And that's not a foreign concept. Like this is, you know, in theoretically speaking, in the K-12 environment, everyone receives a grant to go to a public option. Everyone, and it is subsidized by the state. Now, I can easily argue higher education is as basic as K-12 education it, it, um, has been. And so for me, we've got to move with the times. Now, I don't believe private institutions should get that same subsidy just like in the, in the K-12 um, arena. What you notice in the public um, realm is that state legislatures are a check on college and, colleges and universities. There's a reason why ASU is significantly less expensive than private institutions, because they have a check on it, and it's called state legislatures. That's why I really do believe, hey, we should make this, um, uh, at least having public options for free, and if you choose to go to a private institution, that's on you, just like in the K-12 arena. So for me, this is not a, a stretch in terms of policy. This is a stretch of the imagination for many people to, 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 to get this out of their head that going to college is not the same as it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. It is not. All right. Another question that we've had is that it says that Canceling student debt may solve the issue in, in the short term, but how would you go about fixing, fixing the systemic issues that cause minorities to attend schools with less funding in poor neighborhoods and receive lower quality of education and thus qualify for less funding for college? Would we, just, would we not just see this student loan issue pop back up again in 20 years? Yeah, again, I really do believe that, one, we need to be supporting colleges and universities much more, in, in including this state. States are s slowly but surely trying to make public institutions private. And that's going to hurt us in the long run, in my opinion. That the reason why we achieved so much during the Industrial Revolution the reason why we achieved so much, even during Reconstruction, where black people were producing patents, we did, that, that gets overlooked, that period. We were producing patents, doing a lot of great things, because we were investing in higher education. And we witnessed incredible booms in the economy. But yet, now we're basically saying, the only way you should, that you should go to college now is if um, you pay for it yourself. And that just defies the, the history in this country of economic growth. Nothing grows without investment. 
And right now, we are not investing in the innovation economy in ways that we should. It means investments in graduate programs, means investments in, in everything from education to, to art to the various sciences. That's where you see, that's what will spur an economic growth. You know, this, that's what's keeping the um, institutions down. And by the way, many bl uh, black colleges and universities, historically black colleges and universities, are robbed of wealth. In Tennessee, um, it was discovered that $500 million was systematically um, taken from um, the, the black colleges, of the, the state black colleges there. In Maryland, they just settled a lawsuit for $500 million. This is going on all across the country. Wherever you see black students, just like in my housing, wherever you see black communities, there's devaluation. Wherever you see black students, there's going to be a lack of investment. So, yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought that back up. Going back to your presentation, you pointed out that there are some systemic issues that are pervasive and that have continued for, for decades. So I guess that going back to the question again, if we were to cancel student debt, is that going to be the fix, though, no, uh, no. To it, in totality? No, it's not a fix, but it, it will help. <laughs> you know, again, the, what for me is the fix is the ultimate uh, that you need some type of public option in, in, in higher ed. There's no question about that. Uh, debt cancellation is about providing relief for those who essentially had to shoulder the burden of, of doing what we asked them to do. Guess what I tell my son? Go to college. Get the, the best education you can. And we do that, and we actually compromise their, their wealth profile in the process. Wall Street Journal um, released a, 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 an analysis of, a few months ago that showed how a black people's um, wealth status, black college graduates' wealth status is not changing. We're telling them to go to school. One of the reasons why is because they're taking on debt. One of the bright spots of the pandemic is that black um, millennials started buying homes more, right? Now, there's reasons for that. There were black millennials, a um, uh, significant number lived in, um, in big cities. Um, when the pandemic came down, you, sh you shut down the shops, restaurants, bars, no need to buy clothes, you have more discretionary income, you saved your money, you, you go, you live in a black neighborhood because that price point is lower, right? But let's not ever discount what freezing student debt did for them. Automatically, substantively improved their um, debt income ratio just like that. They used that opportunity to buy a home. That's the freedom that comes with debt cancellation, with free college. That's what we should be pushing for. That expands the economy. That brings growth. You know, this idea that we're going to make people pay for things that we ask them to do makes no sense. It's like saying in the K-12 arena, you know, we need you to go to school, but you got to pay for it. We would never say that. But now in this society, if you don't get a college degree, you are essentially saying you're going to be shut out of many of the opportunities afforded to being middle class, period. All right. Um, again, uh, there's also, you know, you know opposition to, to this. Uh, you know, some people say, well, if students shouldn't pay for their education, then who should? Taxpayers? Uh, are well, you yeah. Yeah, trying to should. disrupt the <laughs> traditional yeah. uh, scholarship and philanthropic efforts uh, with this program? Yeah, and this is another thing. It's like, man, uh, when people ask questions like that, it's almost as if we did not go through the pandemic. We showed that when the federal government provides trillions, in this case, trillions of dollars of subsidy, you can actually bolster an economy. Remember when the pandemic first hit, there were a lot, a lot of predictions from economists, think tanks, university. People said we will be in a, a depression, we'll be in a recession for, for years to come. Guess what? Ha that didn't happen because we, we gave capital directly to people. 
to we the from child tax credit to freezing student loans to PPP assistance, although a lot of black people didn't get it, by giving subsidies to people, we saved a country and we showed growth. You know, we've got to take that lesson and say, hey, this investment thing actually, by, by not just um, cr uh, creating investments into large companies, which trickle down did not work, it did not work. Um, when we give to regular people, everyone benefits. And so that's what I'm trying to, this is not like, a, shouldn't be a stretch, but this is what people hear, taxes. It's like, yeah, taxes should pay for the, and you already pay for a lot of different things through taxes, and it actually showed up wonderfully during this pandemic. So for me, it's about, allowing our taxpayer dollars to do the collective good. But and one more thing is that um, there is this big divide in this country around is, in, is education an individual good versus a social good. It is both, no question. But if we don't emphasize the social good, we're going to go down a path that you're, you're currently witnessing, where division and political discord runs the day. I, I do, I'm hopeful, we were during lunch, we were talking about, am I hopeful? I am hopeful. I also re realize there will be much pain over the next five years because of this political discord. All the reason why we should be going to school together, learning together, working together. The first time I really had diversity in my life was in the college and university setting. And we are eliminating every day that opportunity when we create barriers because of cost. We cannot allow that to happen. All right, so let's just say if, I, if my student loans are running me, let's say $500 a month, yeah. and the government cancels my debt and all of a sudden, okay, I don't have to pay that anymore. How do we account for the fact that that extra 500 that I have now that I'm not going to go out and create some other bill or use that to go, you know, buy a car or go shopping or whatever? How do we know that 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 money is going to be used to create the wealth that you're, you're talking yeah, about? There's a lot of uh, skepticism, um, when it, particularly when it comes to black folk, of whether or not um, we're going to use money and buy I don't know, gold chains and, and, and Jordans. You know, that's where that comes from. And the reality is, like I, I, I uh, shared earlier, is that what we saw during the pandemic, guess what millennials did with their extra money? They bought homes. They are investing in things that, in, that helps the economy. In, in fact, when the pandemic hit, guess what? credit, um, um, uh, uh, actually, borrowing went down. People were saving money during the pandemic. Everybody. I mean, th those who could. Those who could. But overall, black, white, Latino, you saw people using credit less, people really um, investing more. Another bright spot in the economy, now there's a reason for it, but the, the, um, you saw more black businesses started in black neighborhoods more than any other group. You can argue that's because the unemployment rate was higher, the job market was tighter, but this idea that you're going to be irresponsible with that money is not founded. People want to own a home. They want a car. They want to go to work. They want to go to graduate school. They want to make a name for themselves and their families. You know, they don't want just another pair of fancy Adidas. I mean, I may want a pair of fancy Adidas, um, but the reality is we have got to learn how to trust people more, particularly black people. That, that is sort of this, you know, white supremacist thinking that if you somehow get 500 extra dollars, you're going to waste it. I mean, it just, it just doesn't, it's not founded. I mean, it's unfounded. All right, we got a question from the audience. Uh, do you see debt cancellation plus free college as fundamentally anti-capitalist? 
No, no, no. There's lots of capitalist countries that actually provide free college. I mean, th again, this is not something that is different. I mean, if you're in Germany, guess what? You can go to the university. You can get, um, you, you can, if you get hurt, you go to the hospital. You don't have, you don't have a copay. You don't have, like, there are other places that subsidize the basic goods. And that's where I'm, that's, you know, what I want to be clear about is that when you're talking about education, when you're talking about health care, these are basic services you shouldn't have to be wealthy to get. You know, and that's what I, I talk a lot about wealth and, 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 I, and I get it. A lot of people will say that we need to, you know, economic our way to prosperity. But there's some things that I don't care if you're rich or poor, you should have access to. And a higher education is one of those things. So again, this is not something, it's only in America do we have this system uh, like, like this, where, we're pay, where we made higher education a luxury. It's no longer a luxury. Anybody in this room, no, go out into the job, uh, a job market without a college degree. See how far you get. See what kind of benefits you get. They may call you an essential worker and, not get, and, and, and pat you on the back, but you, but you will have um, um, less um, housing stability, a worse uh, food stability, more likely they'd be incarcerated, um, you know, so many negative things. And so from, and then also there's a crowd that will say, you know, college is, is too expensive. I say, try being without a college degree. See how, how much uh, 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 things cost them. And this idea, and you hear this all the time, uh, the trades, we should be focused on the trades. Those jobs are dwindling every single day. Automation is taking those jobs. Not that we will always need certain service work and we need to pay them, pay people in that work appropriately. But overall, this idea that uh, the, that, that you're somehow going to avoid higher education in the future doesn't make any sense. We need highly trained individuals that tap into their humanness, that when we're talking about art, culture, um, um, science, and all these, this is what we need now, not someone who can pick up a wrench while that's important. We need to emphasize, emphasize higher education moving forward. Another question from the audience. You've conducted quite a bit of research. Were there anything in your findings, was there anything in your findings that surprised you, that you found? Oh, man, yes. Um, how, I, I wrote another report. There's a couple folks from St. Louis here. And how many cities really tried to incarcerate their way to safety and how they, how much we invest in things that do not offer a return. You know, I can, I, I, you know, when, when it comes to conversation about defund the police or a criminal justice system and, and these things, people don't understand that when you invest in, in crime prevention, that's not, that's not gonna uh, drive economic development Investing in police doesn't drive growth. If anything, you're literally extracting people out of, out of economies. You're literally saying, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not going to work, you're going to be here. That actually hurts families, economies overall. Certainly safety is a, a first priority good. No question about that. If you don't have safety, you don't have a lot of things. With that said, and, and uh, any initiative that emphasizes um, policing is not going to show growth overall. So I'm always surprised how people are willing to invest in things that won't excite growth and are wildly unwilling to invest in people who can excite this economy. You mentioned earlier that you felt as a, you felt hopeful about uh, something happening with this. You mentioned uh, Elizabeth Warren's uh, proposal. You mentioned Biden's proposal, and some other potential options that exist. Uh, so, if you are an advocate for this, 
What can you do to help to support this and maybe get behind it? Oh, there are many different campaigns um, that you can participate in. NAACP has a, a, a 50 and beyond, um, 50,000 and beyond campaign. Um, there's the free college campaign. There are a lot of different efforts here. And actually here in Arizona, there's um, groups working on, on, on this issue. So I would join one of those um, um, organizations and I would compel you, if you get a chance and if there are courses in your, um, in, um, that you can take on um, wealth, focus on the student debt issue. Um, it's a fascinating look at what we should be investing in in the future more moving forward um, and how we have changed over time. How um, um, I always love looking at the, the original land grant acts um, and, and how we quickly invested in farmers during the day to say, hey, you need to learn how to, to, to manage these crops. And that was our really first big, big, bold investment in mass education. Because before that, guess what? We were, you know, colleges and universities were largely private towns uh, and um, private schools and small towns. You had certainly you had the colonial colleges, Princeton, and, and, and things like that. But when we started investing in, in, in mass education, that's when we started seeing the kind of economic growth. Um, that we realize, I want us to do the same again. I want Arizona State to receive the kind of subsidies that it deserves. And not to say it's a beautiful campus, no question about that. But understand the path we're taking is less public subsidy. I, grew, I lived in, in, in Louisiana for 14 years. I saw my budget, when I taught at the University of New Orleans, my budget was cut in half within five years by a governor. In half. You know, and you get what you get in Louisiana. You know, and so for me, I don't want universities to go that route. But I also understand the way to get there is through some form of federal and state subsidy that doesn't exist right now. And so that's what we got to work towards. Well, good. Um, so what's next uh, for you in, in your, your quest uh, in terms of sharing information about this? We're coming up on uh, the close of our session here, but uh, what's next? Oh, for me, it is working with members of Congress on this issue. Um, I've worked with several Congre uh, Congress folk on this, on this issue, worked with the NAACP on this issue. Um, and I also will be writing a lot about other debt to cancel. Um, when we talk about wealth, there's only two, there's two main uh, uh, variables here. We're talking about your assets minus your debt. And there's only way to, one way to close this wealth divide. We either got to give people more a assets or reduce debt. Reducing debt only gets you so far. No, it only gets you so far. At some point, we need home ownership, business ownership, land ownership, some form of reparations, which is occurring at the, the local levels. Um, but, those are, but more importantly, we need to all be working on a reparative culture. Know that exclusion didn't come from Washington. It went to, to Washington. Redlining, for instance, started in Baltimore. It started there and it worked its way up to other cities and finally got to Washington, D.C., where they made it federal policy. We need reparative culture in, 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 in places such as Phoenix, Tempe, other places, local initiatives that eventually bubble up. So the, the folks here, um, there's lots of things you can do on the ground on this issue and other issues. But the goal is not to say we're going to get some federal policy. You know, I work on that certainly. My goal is to compel you that we need a new era of, of reparative policies that address, addresses the harms of the past while giving the future an opportunity to, to succeed. Okay, well, 
Dr. Perry, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, and then your, your book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities, is available wherever books are sold. Wherever fine books are sold. Where, wherever fine books are sold. Uh -huh. And also a recording of today's event and additional resources will be made available in the coming days. Thank you once again for being here and thank you all for turning out. Thank you.